Hey guys, it's Conrad Bobby Luck here, CEO of Investor Prime Real Estate and best-selling author of Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple. Welcome to today's video. I wanted to give you a bit of an update of what's happening in the market right now. And I've been really busy. I wanted to make more YouTube videos, but I've been so busy with my existing clients and helping them uh, get more properties, basically. This is the time where serious investors are going in hard and buying properties at discounts, but not only discounts, that's not that important, which I'll cover today. Getting the right property in the right area is the key thing. And um, I've been so busy with my clients, getting the eight, nine, tenth property, and you know, nearly achieving their objectives of financial independence, which has been fantastic. So I've been working very closely with a lot of my clients, and hence I've been really busy, and hence I haven't been doing many YouTube videos. But I want to give you a bit of an update of what's happening in October in the real estate market in Melbourne, and I want to touch on different topics and subjects. And also, I'm really excited because we're back to live events as well, and we're doing the Real Estate Investing Fast Track Weekend, um, which is coming up, which is amazing in October. We're going to do probably Probably another one, maybe, because this one sold out in a few days. So stay tuned. Make sure you're on our database and you will be receiving an invitation to attend live events. Next year, we're going to go full on and do a lot of live events in the office here in St Kilda. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to live events. I miss doing them. I think they're very exciting and they're very, very kind of um, <clears throat> timely as well, because the market does change at a micro level every week, every month. At a macro level, nothing really changes. The same, same movie playing over and over and over. Bit of a personal disclaimer before we go any further. I haven't met you before. I haven't considered your personal circumstances. So don't consider anything that I'm talking about today as financial advice. This is purely for educational purposes only. And if you do act on any of my advice, it's at your own risk. If you do want to um, seek professional help, please do so. But make sure that professional has the results that you want to achieve. Not just letters after his name, which is majority of the people. Broke academics. Stay away from them. Also, just for those who haven't heard me speak before, my background, um, <clears throat> I'm a real estate agent. I've got a company in St Kilda called Investors Prime Real Estate, where I source properties in the top 50 highest capital growth suburbs in Melbourne, as well as 15 suburbs that are going through gentrification. My background is mortgage broking, private banking, NAB, and also my original background when I got out of Monash University was financial planning. I worked for Australian Uni Funds Management with unlisted property trusts. The most important thing is that I'm actually a property investor myself. I'm investing, I'm refinancing properties, revaluating properties, getting equity. I'm doing all the things that I teach you guys to do. So I'm sharing this information openly with the sole purpose of really just telling you what I'm doing and, and how people like myself keep making money irrespective of what the market's doing. And that's what the purpose of this video is. Also, if you want to get a copy of my first book, which is Property Finance Made Simple, jump onto bookonfinance.com.au, Amazon or eBay. And this is my second book, which is also got number one bestseller multiple times, Real Estate Made Simple, um, or Amazon or any good bookshop. And I want to thank you guys for supporting my books. I'm selling hundreds per month, which is, which is great to see. It's, it's always kind of nerve wracking when you're writing a book. You don't know if anyone's going to buy it <laughs> apart from your mum, you know? So, um, I know a lot of authors end up with, uh, garages filled with books and they never go any further beyond that point. So my books are selling out in the hundreds per month, um, in the thousands per year. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite incredible. Like you see here on Amazon, I've hit number one many times for both books and m multiple times where both have been number one and two and three in various categories on Amazon. So I want to really thank you guys. It's a humbling experience. Let's get into it. So I want to give you a bit of stats to start off with, just a bit of a market summary. And then I want to go through c certain things that are happening in the market, like interest rates, rentals, capital growth, different suburbs that are booming, different suburbs that are underperforming. Um, I don't want to go into too much unnecessary technical jargon that really has no application to you as an investor. So I want to filter out the essentials and give you the stuff you need to be aware of in order to kind of have your finger on the pulse, so to speak, of what's happening right now in Melbourne in September 2022. Now, remember, we're going into October. We're always looking back at stats. The most accurate stats are about a month old. So, um, and beyond that, three months old is even more accurate. Um, the reality is that real, real estate agents are pretty lazy and um, they take months to let people know what they've sold and how much they've sold it for. And remember, most settlements are three months 
So when you sell a property to the to the point where the banks and uh, you know people like the state revenue office become aware of that sale, it could be up to three months. So we we never quite know where we are currently. We've got a good idea, but we're always kind of looking back at data and saying, "Oh, that's where we were," you know. But I've I've got a really good sense of where we are in in Melbourne at the moment, which is good. Before we go into micro level stuff, I just want you to just keep this in mind because. There's going to be a lot of negative media out there talking about doom and gloom and how the market's free falling and <laughs> Armageddon and bloodbath on the street. Now, I, I laugh about it because I've seen this play out over and over for the last 25 years. But if you're starting out in the industry, if you're new to the property market, you might be scared. So I want to just put things into perspective for you because this is very important to understand. The residential property market in Australia is worth about $10 trillion, 9.8, it goes up to 10, depending on the month, right? Where if you look at the superannuation pool, it's 3.4 trillion, the Australian stock exchange is only 2.7 trillion, and commercial real estate is 1.2 trillion. So residential real estate is the biggest thing we have to invest in, okay? Now, 21% or 2.1 trillion is in mortgages. So the LVR, in Australia, in residential property is 21%. Is that a low LVR? Yes. So imagine a million dollar home, $210,000 mortgage. There's a lot of buffer, there's a lot of equity in the market. And the most important thing to understand is that the mortgages are not spread equally throughout every suburb. They are completely clustered in the fringe suburbs, in New House and Land Estates. The established suburbs in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane are completely paid off or have very low mortgages and there's, therefore there's no need for anyone to dump those properties. That's why the market will never crash because people in, in Melbourne, in, in rich suburbs, couldn't care less what's happening in the media. The houses are paid off. They're living in Armadale in a $3 million house with a $200,000 mortgage, probably a line of credit to buy shares. They really don't care about the market, what's happening with the interest rates. It doesn't affect them, guys. And the media keeps talking about this notion like everyone's got a 95% mortgage suddenly and everyone's gonna do the same thing. And they always show you these families losing houses in the fringe suburbs. You know, Jenny and Brian recently bought a AV Jennings house and land package and now they're losing their house, you know? Yeah, but they don't show you the people in Point Piper losing their house or in Turak in Melbourne or in Melbourne, do they? Because those people will never lose their house. So the reality is you gotta understand that the market has very low gearing. The debt ratio is extremely, extremely low, 21%. So in my opinion, forget about everything else. Just because of that fact, the market's unlikely to, to um, fail long term. It's, it's just, it's, it can't happen, okay? Just look at the maths. Forget about the, the white noise and the fake media, as Donald Trump puts it. 57% of household wealth is held in houses. It's too big to fail. If it was on the brink of failing, the banks would bail it out. They understand it's too big to fail. The government would get involved. But it's never going to even get to that stage, guys. If this was 80% mortgages, then, then I would be worried. Then I would be listening to the media, okay? But it's 21%, guys. 21% mortgages on the $10 trillion market. So what are they talking about? It's just, it's craziness, craziness. So in terms of auction clear rates in Melbourne, and this is last year, and this is this week. So the dark purple one is this week and this kind of pinkish, I guess it's kind of light purple is last year. So in Melbourne, we've got, uh, what is Melbourne? 420 suburbs, but let's say Melbourne, 65% or 64.4% auction clear rate. So out of 10 homes, 6.4 got sold and 3.6 got passed in. Last year was 58.5. Now remember last two years we had COVID lockdowns, virtually non-existent market. There was a lot of times we couldn't hold an auction or you couldn't go to the property physically. Uh, people had to do it over the internet. So, you know, obviously, yeah, you know, it, it's 65% average market, slow, slow to conservative. You can see Sydney there, for example, 60, which is lower than 80% last year. And then Brisbane, 52.8%, um, 79.1. And then Adelaide, 75 this year, 85.1 last year. So in terms of, is that a figure to watch out for? You know, when we're in the boom, which we're not, we're going into a downward trend. 
Um, we go, we go up to 90%, you know, 85, 90, 95. I've seen 96.7 once, you know, which was extreme, which is virtually every property got sold, which is, which is, you know, not a good thing. Remember, landlords are always unrealistic about how much the house is worth. They always think it's worth more than it's worth because, because it's the biggest asset they're holding. They always want to get the, the biggest price. So use this as a very kind of, uh, a rough indicator of the pulse of the market, I guess, rather than anything else. You know, and in terms of total auctions, you can see that 64.4% was the clearance rate, 996 auctions were held that week. Um, the results were, uh, CoLogic auction results were 836. The cleared auctions were 538, un uncleared were 298. A lot of agents will withhold information if they haven't sold the property at auction to make the numbers look better. Traditional real estate agents. Um, because they don't want to have a negative impact on the market. Um, so the, the data isn't that accurate. There's a lot of um, withholding of data in the, in the industry that is very prolific. Um, so you can see there, yeah, you know, 65% six, auction clearing rates, average pulse, average, nothing special. It's not booming. It's not, you know, it's not 50%, like in, like in Brisbane, which is five out of 10 houses getting passed in. Um, but there's different reasons for that as well, because people have been conditioned to high prices, now prices are down and they refuse to sell, you know, and that's, that's the reality. Um, so you can see there, we, it's very cyclical, you know, it goes up and down, up and down. This is the four week average of auction clearing rates in, in Australia. So the combined major capital cities, I should say. So we are going, we went down and I don't know why would you combine all the major capital cities? They're very different to each other. You've got to break them up. So if you look at Melbourne, for example, you know, September down and up. It doesn't mean much though because the volume shrinks. So whenever you're looking at auction clear rates, you've got to look at it in the context of volume on the market, vendor discounting and how many days on the market as well. If you look at Melbourne, um, as I mentioned before, you've got to break down Melbourne into inner suburbs, 60%, and these will have different markets within them. In the east, 71 percent. In the south, 67. North east, 68.8. North west, 59.8. Outer east, 69.1. South east, 66.7. West, 54.6. And then Mornington Peninsula, which is 75 percent. So there's a big difference between the west, for example, 55 and 75, virtually 20 percent difference in demand. But also, you look at the, the actual number of auctions. Um, you're looking at 116 versus 16, one tenth. So you've got to look at things in terms of context as well. Don't just, as an investor, take numbers at face value. Look beyond the numbers. Look at the fundamentals of what they're actually saying. In terms of performance of the market, weekly change, Melbourne is down 0.2%. Um, for the month, 1% negative. And then for the year, 4.9%. Um, or 12 months rolling average, 3.1. We're definitely going onto a downward slope on the property clock, which I'll show you in a second from Heron to the wide value, was we're at three o'clock. So there's no question about it. Melbourne had a boom and it went up a lot. In fact, in the last, you know, from January to January, uh, 22 to 21, we went up by 22% and then we're going down. And we're still higher than pre-COVID prices, by the way. So we don't actually go back to where we were two or three years ago. There's a dip and then it keeps going up again. And that's what, that's what actually happens. But you can see that 2012, 2022, you see that cyclical nature of the property market, you know, and it's roughly, um, and it's getting actually, because COVID threw things out a lot, this kind of 10 year cycle now has been destroyed basically because it's not natural anymore. We have a, we had a, um, an induced cycle, I guess, because, because of COVID. We were forced to have lockdowns, auctions were cancelled, um, agents couldn't physically inspect properties, people couldn't physically go and see properties. There's a lot of, lot of stuff that happened last two years that is completely abnormal. Well, since 2019, really. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, if you look at the 12 month average of listings, in terms of new listings and total listings, you can see there, um, so this is new listings 12 months, 21.3%, and this is normal listings. So the volume of listings, especially in key suburbs in Melbourne, is shrinking. In outer suburbs, it's increasing, and same with apartments. But in, in blue chips places where people want to live, 
which are, let's call them aspirational suburbs, okay? And so not the richest suburbs, but just aspirational suburbs. Um, volume is down, you know, 10, 15%, sometimes up to 25, 30% compared to the normal volume that should be in the market at the same time. Um, so that's something that's, um, you know, that's, that's occurring because people can't get the prices they want. They have no mortgages against the property or the mortgage is manageable versus the, compared to their income. And therefore they choose not to sell. And that's all that happens, you know, which is quite reasonable. And, and, you know, that's what people do. I mean, if you've got a property that you enjoy living in, you've got no pressure to sell. You want $3 million for it, people giving you 2.5. Why would you sell? Why wouldn't you just keep it for another five years and then sell it for $3 million? You know, it's a hundred grand a year. You know, that, and that's the, that's the psychology of those people. But if you're in a house on land package that you've just settled through a metric on and you're geared 95% and you've lost your job or something's happened in your life that has adversely affected your financial situation, you've got to sell. You haven't got the luxury of deferring your sale. So, and, and because it's happening to you, it's probably happening in the area because remember Australia is very demographically clustered in terms of suburbs and, and areas. The same kind of similar people live in similar suburbs and do similar things and earn similar amounts of money. So you've got to kind of look at that as an advantage and disadvantage as well as an investor. By the way, I'm not judging people by how much money they make or where they live. You know, people sometimes say to me, oh, I live in a suburb that you don't like. As I keep telling you guys, I have no preferences for suburbs. This is just a money-making exercise. I'm teaching you guys this information to make money so you can take the money and work less hours, have holidays, do the things that you want to do rather than be stuck in a cubicle somewhere for 80 hours a week answering emails, you know, which is crazy. Now, in terms of decline of values, the market is dropping faster right now than any other time apart from 1989. So you can see that these are, because the market is cyclical, goes up and down, and we're into a decline cycle right now for the major capital cities, you can see that 22, which is the dark purple line, it is more extreme than any other times that we've had, right? It's dropped 2.7%. But remember, the higher the, the starting point, the greater the decline angle, okay? Because of it has to go back and correct the last year or two and then go back up again, okay? So there's nothing abnormal happening. You look, look at 2017-19, you can see there it went down, and then 2015 and 16, it was a very short cycle, negative 1.7%. 2010 and 12, the pink one, very long, 4.3, um, and this is months. So these cycles last different types of months. The one, for example, in 2015 and 16 was only five months, where the purple one was 22 months. This light purple one, 9.3. So every cycle has a different time around the clock. It's not exactly 10 years anymore. And especially with this, this is combining major capital cities. So, and they're all counter cyclical to each other virtually. So, um, well, there's a deferred, there's a delay between Melbourne and Sydney, but I mean, Brisbane and Melbourne are, are really far apart now in terms of the peak, peaks and troughs of the cycle. So, you know, what does this all mean? It really doesn't mean anything, guys. This is the thing. It's like, like to me, it's just, it's just all this stuff that the media talks about. It's just nonsense. Like, it's like this, right? Let's say I want to buy a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes Benz, okay? And it's down to ninety six thousand. Do I really care? Or it's one hundred and three thousand? I still don't care. <laughs> I'm still going to buy it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just. Yeah, so what? It's five grand this way or that way. But the media is like, oh my God, it's down five grand. It's going to plummet to nothing. Well, then they'll get it for free. I don't know. Is, it, is that what it means when it crashes? Like they'll be saying, would you like a Mercedes Benz, sir? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So you really crash. Yes, the bubble crash, we're giving away Mercedes Benz for free. You know, is that what it means? I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it's just nonsense. This whole thing. You know, the, the, I've been doing this for 25 years, guys. The same market, right? And remember, I studied in financial planning. I've got a business commerce degree. Because I understand stats, when I started, when I was 21, and I'm 46 now, right, I was really serious about these numbers. I was like, wow, you know, look at comparing different things. I had Excel spreadsheets and I had different software. It just doesn't mean anything, guys. Just keep buying properties whenever you can buy properties at a good price. But remember, you've got to know the distinction between value and price are two different things. 
Okay, so you want to buy quality assets. Don't worry about the discount. Discount is irrelevant 10 years from now. If you get it for 1% cheaper or 3% cheaper, the people that want discounts and think they're going to time the market have one thing in common. They're always broke and they've got no properties. They're just theorists. I see them all the time. I'm going to wait three months. Yeah, yeah, good. good. Oh, so you've got no properties behind you, but you're going to wait a few months because you know what's going to happen. Great. Okay, so I've been doing this for 25 years. We don't know what's going to happen, but you know what's going to happen, but you've got no properties at all. And I've got, I've got millions, millions of dollars in equity. So you've worked it out, but you've got no assets, no results. Okay, good, good, good luck with that. <laughs> That's what it means. A core logic study of 30 years of housing values offers some solace to those whose property prices have been retreating, finding that for the past 30 years of peaks and troughs indicate the market will bounce back eventually. The data demonstrates that the flow of the Australian property cycles with the promise of, of over the long term reliable growth. And while housing values move through cycles of growth as well as declines, the long-term trend is undeniably upwards, Core Logic Executive Research Director Asian Pacific Tim Wallace said. Over the past 30 years, dwelling values nationally have increased 382%, or in annual compounded terms, 5.4% on average since July 1992. Because remember, there's apartments, there's, there's bad areas, and there's good areas, and there's okay areas. So this is the average. Overall, the long-term trend highlights the cycle nature, cyclical nature of the housing market. So you can see there, there's 30 years of houses and units. It's upward trending. The growth has been, um, this is combined major capital cities uh, for housing units, 30 years, 453.1% growth. And then um, for units, it's 306. And you can see there, regional areas have pretty much the same thing. So you know your Bendigo, Ballarat, Shepparton in Melbourne. It's a microcosm of Melbourne. They're just cheaper, okay? But look at the price difference now. I mean, 900 for houses, 623 for houses in regional. They started off roughly, I don't know, this is probably 150, this is 170. They're very close together at the beginning in, in 92. And now there's a difference because there's more pressure on major capital cities because there's more jobs there more migrations coming into the centres, and therefore there's more scarcity and more pressure on existing stock. That's all it is. But can you make money in the regional towns? Absolutely. Like I keep telling people, Bendigo is probably one of the best capital growth performing regional centre in Australia, full stop. But it's not a mining town. There's no volatility. It's completely diversified and is driven by white collar professionals more than blue collar professionals and farmers. So you've got the Bendigo Stock Exchange, you've got the original Myers head office, you've got, um, you know, there's, there's, um, Bendigo Bank head office. It's, it's amazing and it's very diversified. There's, there's 1500 marketing and accounting and legal companies. They've got an amazing town center. Architecturally, it's stunning. During the gold rush period, Bendigo had more gold extracted from it than California. So, if you want to invest in a regional town that it's a fraction of the price of Melbourne that's cash flow positive, Bendigo is the way to go. And look at the evidence. These regional towns are performing really well. Now, I don't source anything in regional towns, and I have, I'm have i not offering that service to you. I'm just giving you some commentary and feedback. So, you know, is there going to be bumps in the road? Yeah, absolutely. Does it make a difference long term? No. Is it nice to get something that's really good value at a discount? Yes. Yes. You know, if you're buying a $100,000, $200,000 car and you're getting five grand off, fantastic. Okay. But it doesn't make any difference long term, guys. Don't focus on this market timing. Just keep focusing on the fundamentals, getting market ready and buying properties whenever you can. Whenever you can, guys. Remember, the market since the Second World War has been upward trending in Australia, but it's always cyclical. There's bumps in the road. Don't worry about the bumps in the road. Focus on the long-term growth average, 10, 20 years. If you start having heart attacks because you buy a property here and go down by 10%, you, this is the wrong game for you guys. You have to get out of this industry and go into the stock market or something else because you won't survive, you know? You've got to look at property over 10, 20 years, not 12 months. 12 months is not a good way to gauge your performance. It's a long term. 
game plan. In Melbourne, apartments price surge. Remember I did a video not so long ago about the apartment market um, hitting the lowest point and then going up, and that's happened already. So the latest data shows us that prices in some inner Melbourne suburbs have surged by as much as 21% in the past 12 months, despite the broader decline in home values across the country, data from CoreLogic shows. Apartments values across East Melbourne, South Bank, Docklands and North Melbourne rose strongly in the past 12 months, jumping by 20.9%. 19.6% and 16% and 14.1% respectively in the highest level since March 22. Does this mean it's a good time to buy apartments? Yes and no. It might be a good time to buy apartments, but remember, when watch my video on apartments, there's a lot of really bad stuff out there, okay? Personally, I wouldn't touch them. Okay, unless it's an Art Deco development somewhere in South Sierra, there's only eight, you've got a land component, there's redevelopment potential, and you're going to reno the property, yes, you know, or the six brand new ones in Bentley, next to, next to Centre Road Shopping, which is probably the best shopping in Melbourne, you know, with a good land components, yes. But when there's 50 or 100 in the tower, unless it's like Turek or, or, or Hawthorne, you know, I wouldn't touch it, you know, but Docklands and South Bank, it's a complete disaster. Having said that, though, having said that, if you want to live in Docklands, because remember, I'm talking about making money here. I'm not talking about livability. Two separate things, okay? If you have set your eyes that you want to definitely live in Docklands for retirement or for lifestyle because you love the city, then buy a three-bedroom apartment where you can't build out the views, this could be the best time to buy right now in the next decade. I think it's the bottom of the market. Don't buy one bedders. Forget about one bedders. It's like selling ice to Eskimos. No one wants one bedroom apartments. Two, you have to have two bathrooms and a living and a dining area and maybe a study nook, okay? Three is what you want to focus on. And I've seen three bedrooms in Docklands from as low as 850, which is really cheap because most of them were a million, 1.1, 1.2. The ones for 850, you've got to be careful with views and configuration of floor plan. And I've done videos about this, so you might want to check it out. But really, East Melbourne, very good location for apartments. There's going to be a lot of future stock though, just so you understand. East Melbourne is a very old part of Melbourne. Actually, probably the oldest buildings in Melbourne can be located in East Melbourne. Um, and there's a lot of areas that have been rezoned for high density redevelopment, but it's a good location. 20%, South Bank 19.6, Dockland 16, um, North Melbourne 14.1, and Parkville 11.4. Parkville is a great area, very kind of rough looking, but it's next to the medical precinct. So apartments will do well there, and there's always limited stock um, on the market to rent. But I would go low density in Parkville with balconies overlooking the park. Majority of Parkville is a park, which is publicly zoned land, which cannot be re redeveloped. So if you're going to buy apartments, if you buy it on the boundary of the park, where your balcony is overlooking parkland and the city, and, and the, you can, no one can put a tower in front of you and block out that view, that's probably the way to go. So, yeah, so if you want apartments, guys, in Melbourne, this is the time to do it. It's, it was already moved. It's moved since the last video. The last video was when it was the bottom of the market. I picked it 100% correctly, and now it's moving. It's already moving. So you've already, if you haven't got in yet, you've missed the bottom already, okay? The bottom was behind us. Suburbs struggling with uh, most to pay mortgages. Massive mortgage stress with house and land estates. And it's only 1%. Now, you're going to have a lot of stories about people living in tents and, and, you know, on current affairs and today, tonight about John and Jenny and he's a public servant and she's a teacher, you know, and they were living in some property and the evil landlord decided to evict them for whatever reason, maybe because they were complaining about mould or, I don't know, just some bullshit reason. This is all left-wing media, by the way. It's always on ABC, you know, the evil landlord. Anyway, they evict them and they can't go back into the property market um, because Jenny's got, you know, green hair and she's a vegan vegetarian that eats almond milk and um, no one wants to lease to her. So <laughs> don't email me if you're a vegetarian vegan. Um, and uh, I love almond milk, by the way. I'm, on, I'm onto it. I'm being converted, okay? So I'll put in my coffee now. Um, <laughs> but this only represent 1% of the population, okay? So you can see that mortgage stress is prolific in areas 
So there's high concentration of mortgage stress and evictions, okay, where people can't get evicted. Also, the other part of the equation is not only people getting evicted, they're losing their houses and they can't go back and rent and they end up in those tents as well and they end up in camping grounds. So they can't hold on to their mortgage, they sell the house, they lose all their equity, they're still working full time, but they can't afford to rent anything because they're competing with the rental um, people and there's 60 applicants for every property and they get uh, displaced. And they're legitimately working people. I mean, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like this before, by the way. And the reason it's happened is because the Labor government and left-wing part of society keeps making it harder for property investors to buy multiple properties. So if you keep doing that, you're going to have the same problem we have in Ireland at the moment, where in Ireland, there is no rentals on the market. There's there's something like 800 rentals in the whole country because of the tax levy that they've imposed on property investors and la- evil landlords. So guys, labour people, okay, academics, if you keep pushing investors out of the market you're going to be eventually displaced and you won't be able to get back into the market. That's the reality of the situation. So keep pushing them. You know, it doesn't impact anything that I do. My house is paid off. I don't give a shit, you know. But I'm saying is the average Australian is going to pay for it. Not people like me. You can't do anything to me, okay, because you haven't got the power to do anything to me, okay. The reality is I'll never sell any of my properties and my kids will get all my properties unencumbered. But that's my decision and that's by design. But what I'm saying is, for those people who keep stuffing up negative gearing rules, this, that, the other, thinking that somehow landlords are pricing young people out of the property market, all you're going to be doing is reducing the volume of rentals on the market, which is what's happening right now. Now, this is the mortgage stress. You can see there in Melbourne, Victoria, so you've got 87, 0.87%. So 71 or 0.71% of Australians are under mortgage stress right now. Now, remember, interest rates have gone up, but let's put it into perspective, guys. Interest rates are 2.35%, which is the bank swap rate, okay? And everyone's suddenly complaining, oh, my God, we can't pay, everything's gone up. And, yeah, look, fuel prices have gone up. Goods and services have gone up. Because of the war in Ukraine, um, there's been a lot of pressure on energy, especially oil and petrol, absolutely. Um, I mean, the other day, I've got a 63 um, S-Class AMG Mercedes-Benz. Normally, I put in $160, $150. Now, it's up to $190, $196, you know, the other day. So, and then it lasts me about two days, by the way. It's a beautiful thing. You can sort of accelerate. You can see the petrol gauge is going... I love it. And for every one of my V8 cars, by the way, I love electric cars because for every 10 Teslas you're offsetting the carbon footprint on my V8 S63 AMG. So God bless those Tesla um, and Prius uh, driving um, people. It's fantastic. Thank you for offsetting my carbon footprint. So the 10-year average is 2.58%, historically speaking. 20-year average is 3.94. And the 30-year average interest rate, this is the bank swap rate. This is not the variable rate. The variable rate's about 2% on top of this. 1% to 2%, depending on the lender, is 4.99. So we're still historically at the lowest possible level we've ever seen. What's happening with society is people have instant gratification. They want it now syndrome. Pay for it later. Generally speaking, if you're a low income, you should be, the maximum you should be putting towards your mortgage for your PPR is 30% of your income after tax. Okay? People have spent 60% of their income on mortgages and now they wonder why they can't eat food and pay for fuel. Because you overextended yourself and prices have gone up. And unfortunately, that's the reality of, of, of the world, of life. You know, I'm not responsible for setting prices. You know, don't blame me. So it, it is what it is. An estimated one in five mortgage holders of 551,000 Australians will struggle to pay back their mortgage if interest rates continue to rise. <laughs> really? Well, that's no way. So these are, these are the main postcodes where we have the highest um, loans in the rears. Okay, so if you look at Victoria, this is for Australia, obviously. So you've got WA, um, South Australia, Victoria, it's Broad Meadows, which is 3047, 3.51% of people in Broad Meadows are struggling with their mortgage. If you look at um, 
Further, in terms of, it's about 1%. It, it kind of, you know, in April, it's now 0.87. It got up to 1% in November 21. With COVID lockdowns, there was more pressure on income. So there was people were earning less money. But if you look at the heat maps in Melbourne, um, it's always the worst suburbs. I shouldn't say use the word worst because people will ring me and saying, you, you, you know, you don't like Broad Meadows. The suburbs that are most impacted by increases in interest rates are always the same in Melbourne, which means two things for you. Number one, it's a bargain that you can buy if you want to buy properties in Broadmeadows. Broadmeadows actually does around 6% growth per year, so you can't lose money in Broadmeadows. So if you're a developer and you want to buy land in Broadmeadows, now's the time to buy. You know, you get a cheap block of land, you can subdivide it. So Tullamarine Broadmeadows on the outskirts of Melbourne was the only non-Queensland location to make a top 10 list of mortgage um, deferrals hotspots. However, several other Melbourne and fridge suburbs are showing signs of heightened mortgage stress. And it's Wyndham, Casey South, Whittlesea Wallen, Melton Bacchus Marsh and Burundara. These are the highest mortgage stress areas in Victoria. Okay, and you can see that this is a Melbourne city. These are heat maps. The dark patches represent the highest mortgage stress suburbs in Melbourne right now. So two things are happening while I'm showing you this. And you can see that it's the new house or land estates. So it's the, the four growth corridors that we have in Melbourne. Number one is if you want to buy into the areas, you might get a bargain, especially with a lot of people falling over and the repossessions happening. Number two. If you've got a property there, if you're trying to get uh, refinance the property and get a valuation, now's the worst time to do it because people are fire selling properties. And the valuers will take the lowest of, of comparable sales, which means you might not get the equity out of your property that you want to, to do the things that you want to do. So that's all I'm saying. This is why I'm pointing out this, this reality. I'm not judging people by where they live, what they do. I'm just talking about making money. So remember, with the property cycle goes through the peak of the property market. Then we go to a decline of the property market, which is where we are now. The bottom of the property market, which is where you want to buy. The growth, where you want to refinance and then wait for the next downward. And stick to the fundamentals. That's what it is. Now remember, what happens is the median price is not a good way to gauge the market. The median price is simply the middle property sold in one market compared to the middle property sold in another market. When the market goes down and people can't get prices that they want in the high-end suburbs, they take the stock off the market. So the volume of stock shrinks and the median price shifts to the left. It doesn't mean that everything gets devalued by 10 or 15%. It just means there's less stock and the middle property, which is the median, is 10% or 15% lower compared to the same market last year. That's all it means, guys. So when they say Turex down 15%, it doesn't mean everything in Turex is down 15%, okay? It means the middle property in Turex now is 15% less compared to the middle property price last year. It, this is so fundamental for you to understand, okay? Because if you think everything is getting devalued now in Brighton or Turex, go and make all, go and give lowball offers, see what happens. The agents will laugh at you And this is what happens. In times of economic hardship, the number of buyers willing to pay is reduced and people take volume at the same time. Volume gets taken off and this is what happens to the bell-shaped curve. It moves. So it does. It doesn't mean every property is discounted. So those people who are thinking, I want to wait and pick up a nice mansion in Hawthorne for a million bucks, that's going to be slashed from, you know, that's currently 10, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life because it's not going to happen. Now, what's happening in iron suburbs? Yes, Turek is now 16.9% reduced compared to la same time last year. Lower Plenty, Armadale, Box Hill, Caulfield, Brighton, St Kilda East, Hawthorne, I don't know where Clayton's there, and North Melbourne. They're all down. Does that mean that in Brighton, every property is down 4.5% or Turek 16.9%? No, it means that the volume has shrunk because the high-end mansions in Turak, which are $30 million, $40 million, they've been taken off the market because people don't want to, they're not willing to get a discount and not willing to take a lower price, I should say. That's what that means. 
So when people say, oh, yeah, you bastards in Turek, everyone's lost 20% or 16%. No, they haven't. They've lost nothing. It's just the middle property, guys. Just the middle property. You've got to look beyond the numbers. Look at the fundamentals. Rentals are going through the roof. So Melbourne rentals, the average in June 21, 430, 450 in March 22, 460. But the reality is, forget about, I don't know where people are renting 500 bucks. Normal townhouse in Melbourne in the Bayside has gone from 650, 700 per week to, to 800. It's crazy. They've gone up by 100, $150, um, you know, per week. It's insane. I'm lifting my rentals like there's no tomorrow. I'm getting phone calls from property managers. I'm going, are you serious? Are we going to get that rental though? Or is it going to stay vacant? There is no rentals on the market. Vacancy rates are down to 0 0.7, 0 0.5. Less than 1% in some suburbs, where normally it should be 4.5%. So rentals now have shot up, which means it's easier for my property clients to hold on to their properties. Now remember, when did they buy those properties? They didn't buy it now. They bought them three, five years ago, 10 years ago, and now they're reaping the rewards of their labor. So those of you who are sitting back thinking you're going to be picking the bottom of the market, you can never catch up to what those people did that bought five years ago. You'll never get the same price and you'll never get the same rental increase. So you've missed the boat already by timing the market. This is what I keep telling people, forget about timing of the market. It's time in the market, guys. It's time in the market because you can't get the upswing of rental growth now. You've missed the boat. The boat's not coming back. It was the last one, okay? And that's what's happening so you can't get a property now that's renting for 500, they can increase the rental to 700. That, it doesn't exist. So by timing the market, you've done yourself a disservice and you've missed that on potential of serviceability. That's what it's costing you. It's opportunity costs, guys. That's, that's all it is. So remember, you want to buy as many properties as you can in the shortest possible period of time, not by doing extreme amount of transactions one every, once every 10 years when you think the market's down. So yeah, absolutely. Rentals in Australia in the major capital cities have shot up. People are completely priced out of iconic suburbs in Melbourne, St Kilda, Port Melbourne. They've gone crazy. Elwood, forget about it. It's like in New South Wales, Bondi and those areas. Forget it. Try and getting a townhouse in Bondi or a house. <laughs> Good luck, you know. Um, so tenants are getting evicted and the landlords are renovating the property a little bit, increasing prices astronomically. And that's what they're doing. And they should be able to do that. Why not? It's their property. They took the risk. They took the risk. They speculated and they have to reap the rewards. And this is why there's a division in society now. I see all these left-wing people. Oh, it's unfair. It's unfair. Well, life sucks. Wear a helmet. That's my advice. You want some... You, you think Australia's hard to live in? Go to Poland where I'm from. Go to Eastern Europe. See how long you'll survive with the attitude you have here. <laughs> anyway... This is the property clock. So what's happening is there's a peak of the market, falling yields, oversupply in the property market, rising interest rates, lower property sales. We're here right now. Construction decreasing, which I've already seen. There's a massive decrease in construction. Developers pulled out of the market because of escalating cost and labor shortage. Property prices falling, which, which is six o'clock. Increasing yields. The funny thing is the yields are increasing here this time around, okay? Under supply of rental properties, falling interest rates, rising property sales, construction increasing, and then you get the boom again. It's very predictable and cyclical. Now remember, there's always an emotional peak and a reactive low. But overall, the market is long term. So I guess what I'm telling you in this video is forget about long, short term fluctuations in the market. There's too many variables to predict them accurately to make any money out of them. If you can make money out of them, you should be a billionaire already. You don't need me because <laughs> I can't do it. I can't make money out of the short-term variables. But if you can, you don't need this video, guys. You should already have in your bank balance $100 million, okay? Because none of us can do it. <laughs> so if you can do it, you're amazing. Switch off right now and watch watch um, a cat flush a toilet on YouTube. Reactive high, emotional low. You buy for 10 years on average. That's what I'm saying. Forget about short-term fluctuations. We're in the property cycle. We're over here at the moment in Melbourne, about to go down even further. This is the bottom of the market. Where would the bottom be? I have no idea and I don't really care. It could be end of this year. It could be March next year. I think once migration comes back in the fold, 
um, then the, there'll be more pressure on property prices and the property prices will go up, irrespective of interest rates. But does it really make a difference to me as an investor? No, it doesn't. I don't really care. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so I'm refinancing here predominantly, locking in my lines of credit, and I buy around here. But if I see a good deal over here or over here, I'll still buy it. If I like the property and it's fundamentally correct, I'll buy it. I'd rather overpay for a good property than underpay for a bad one, okay? Because long-term, it doesn't make any difference. So I'd rather overpay for properties as long as the fundamentals are there and it's going to do my 10% per year. That's the psychology you have to have, not trying to get a bargain once a decade. That's not going to make you money. And you're going to see the same bullshit articles written every year. They should just re recycle the same ones. And it's going to be this. I guarantee you, it's always some study at some university campus, because all the campuses are filled with left-wing academics. Study finds housing affordability in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, the worst in New York or Tokyo. It's unaffordable. Oh, wow. No one knew that. <laughs> Young Australians are giving up on the property dream. Young people will never own a house. Boo-hoo. 90% of millennials concerned they won't achieve the great Australian dream. Well, move to Tassie. I don't know. The Aussie, and then suddenly it's all crashing. It's all crashing and everyone's rejoicing that they didn't buy a property because they go, hey, that's good it's crashing because I haven't got one and all these people that have, um, I'm going to lose money. The funny thing is the people that don't have a property, the moment they get into the market, they don't want it to crash. But if they're not in the market, they're happy for it to crash to see other people lose money. It's a weird psychology. Like I personally don't want anyone to lose money. <laughs> I hope everyone makes money. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> Rising interest rates could crash the housing market, which is where we are now. And millennials are mad about it. Why would they be mad? Banks want too many interest rate rises could crash the Aussie housing market, which is exactly what we're seeing now. The property market is at the bottom, then it stabilizes, then goes up again, then no one can afford to get in again. And then and we talk about, then we have all those committee meetings and all those debates about housing affordability and how we can solve the housing crisis. <laughs> yeah, that's what we need, guys. We need more academics here with white papers telling us what not to do. That's the solution. Because they've been very helpful for the last 60 years. You know, just a waste of space. Unbelievable. So we're here now. Melbourne is here at 3 o'clock going to a decline. There'll be another 5-10% reduction in median prices in Melbourne in the next three to six months, let's call it. Guaranteed. It could be longer. By the way, this is from Heron to White Valuers, biggest valuation company in Australia. Independent data. They don't sell anything apart from valuations. So remember, there is the sell phase where people are getting at the lowest point. Then there's the awareness phase where institutional investors get in when there's good fundamentals with property. Then the public gets in, which is from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. This is the worst time to buy property because everyone's already in. You want to buy between 3 and 6 ideally and between 6 and 9. 9 to 12, you don't want to buy anything. You want to be refinancing your properties. So this is where you're refinancing your properties, getting all these comparable sales and locking in your lines of credit and your regional facilities at a high price point. Because remember, comparable sales are only valid for three months. Then they expire. They're no longer valid. It's a different market. So three months is what the market is kind of measured in. Okay, so if you have a house in Cheltenham for 800000 and the one across the road sells for nine hundred, you've got to get your line of credit or redraw increased by 100,000 when you've got three months to do it. And when do you do that? You do it from nine to, to, to 12. Most of the public buy investment properties between nine to 12. Sophisticated investors don't buy there, they buy from here to there and they refinance their properties and get the lines of credit increased. So counter cyclical investing, do it opposite to what everyone else is doing and you win. And then eventually they overpay at the peak and then they usually sell somewhere here or they just despair. And if they buy apartments in Docklands and, and, or Point Cook House or land packages, they've got no growth for another five years. And then they go up suddenly. Who? <laughs> Back again. So the market is cyclical. There's different property clocks around Australia. Um, and there's regional, there's inner suburbs, metropolitan and regional. So in Victoria, we have inner suburbs at three o'clock going down, which is the main suburbs you want to be investing in. 
Metropolitan at the moment is 11 to 12, and then regional is also 11 to 12, which is the peak of the market. So regional towns have already had their boom. They're nearly at the peak. So is it a good time to buy regional towns? I say yes, always, because stick to the fundamentals. From a strategic perspective, okay, from a, so, so once again, a lot of people might be confused about what I'm saying. So am I saying to, to buy now or not? I'm saying if you have no properties, it's always a good time to buy. As you accumulate your properties, you got five or six or seven or 10, then you cannot just keep buying. You're going to be maxed out. So you've got to choose your battles. And this is where you do counter cyclical investing. That's when you start refinancing them at the peak and then buying from three to six round about here. Okay. When you're starting out and you're getting your first one, you want to get in as soon as possible. Okay. It's like joining a gym. You just want to join and start training. Working out what all the, all the exercises are. Then as you get better and more advanced, you start splitting up your body, doing a body split, training five days a week, you know. At the beginning, you just want to hit your whole body once a day, you know, and have a, a break of two days and hit it again. That's what I'm saying. Long term though, guys, dollar cost averaging is the best strategy. Just keep, st stick to the fundamentals. Never buy in Point Cook. Always buy in Elwood. Okay. Can't make it simpler than that. And then Elwood will reward you over 10 years. Point Cook will punish you. I can't make it any more clearer than that. Don't buy Docklands. Do not buy Tane, Triganina, Point Cook. If you buy there, you won't lose money. You just won't make any. It's the same thing. Okay? So we're here to make 10% per annum, not 3%, not inflation. And the way to do that is dollar cost averaging. That's it. Forget about timing, and over a long period of time, you're going to be buying some properties at the peak, some at three o'clock, some at six o'clock, and overall, you're going, to, you're going to average a really good rate and make money. That's that's the game. That is the game, guys. That's it. So yes, we are plummeting faster now than since the 80s. There we are, 2022. That's the decline. What does that mean? It means nothing. Eventually, it will turn and stop as we go to the next property cycle. Ten years from now, there'll be probably three or four other lines going into different directions. What does it mean? It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. You can either be a person who says, this glass is half full or not full enough. I always talk about, I'm always the half full person. I always focus on what's in the glass. And I drink the water. You want to drink? The water in the glass. Forget about the naysayers. Forget about the people that say the glass, the water is getting reduced faster than ever. They drink it. There's not enough water for everyone. Who cares? Okay? Forget about the media, guys. They don't know anything. It's not even fake news. It's unqualified news. They're just not equipped to understand data. That's what it is. These journalists, most of them, because they're not investors, guys. They're just bloody academics sitting there looking at charts that don't have any money in the market, you know? There's very few of them that understand what's happening. So at the same time, when the market's plummeting, Melbourne suburbs are going up. Wow, surprise. So this is June quarter 22, right now, quarter, this quarter. Riddles Creek. 37.5%, Bond Beach, 35.5%, Warrenwood, 29.7%, Frankston South, 28.6%, um, Patterson Lakes, 28.1%, um, Edithvale, 27.5%, No Warren North, 27.2%, Black Rock, 26.3%, Parkdale, 23.7%, Aspendale, 22.9%. Surprise, surprise. The market's down. These suburbs are doing double digits. Stick to the fundamentals. Remember, 95% of the market re is reactive. They react. They get, they get blown around like a, like a paper bag in the wind by the media and people with, ex with no experience, no results. 5%, like myself, respond. And the difference is your level of awareness and knowledge. That's all it is. So what suburbs in Melbourne represent the best value right now? These are the best areas. Like, and this is from December quarter, and this is from, these are the areas that I talked about last year, 
where I'm sourcing a lot of properties. BlackRock, Mentone, Franks and South, Morielic, Albert Park, Caron, Parkdale, Balmoris, Franks and Seaford, St Kilda, Sandringham, Aspendale. They represent the best value for money right now. They're booming right now. They're going to continue to boom right now because those people have money. They don't care about what's happening in the market. They don't care about petrol. They probably have electric cars or V8s that they can afford to put fuel in. Do you think it makes any difference to me whether letters go up to $10 a kilo or $20 a kilo? Does it make any impact in my life if petrol goes to $5 a litre? No, I'll still put in the five bucks per litre. Do you know I mean? It just doesn't make any difference to me at all. There's plenty of people out there like me, much, much wealthier than myself. Not everyone's in the same boat, guys. Not everyone who lives in the suburb has the same challenges. You've got to dig further into suburbs and look at the demographics, income per household, scarcity of stock. Every suburb has a unique dynamic. That's why you've got to do fundamental analysis, not technical analysis. If you do technical analysis on the property market, which is looking at charts and numbers without having an appreciation of fundamental analysis, which is a driver behind those, you're going to fail miserably in investing, I guarantee it. No one has ever made money out of technical analysis. Look at Warren Buffett. It's all fundamental analysis. And they keep telling people what they do. And people just think, well, it's just too simple. Can't be like that. No, it is. It's exactly like that. It is that simple. Buy Port Melbourne. Don't buy Trigonina. It's that simple. Whenever you can. As much as you can. Okay? It cannot be any more simpler than that. Oh, but Connor, it's too expensive. Or I can get a massive house out in Whoop Whoop. I can only get a two better in Port Melbourne. It doesn't make any difference. It's Rolex versus Seiko, guys. It's Mercedes versus Camry. Toyota. You know, it's just, it's just, the saying in real estate, guys, cheap today, cheap tomorrow. Let me show you some of the projects that I'm sourcing. I'll wrap up this video because I've been, I've been talking too long. I'm very cynical, by the way, right? It's the Eastern European part of me. This is why Ukraine won't be conquered by Russia. You watch. People, people were always underestimating. There's, you can't negotiate with those people. And my family is from Ukraine. I'm actually Polish. I was born in Poland in Wrocław on the, Poland, the German border of Poland and Germany. But my mum's family is from Ukraine. And I know those people. They, there is no compromise with those people. They will fight to the last, last breath. That's why they're still there. Unless he goes nuclear, well, then that's going to be crazy. But anyway, Morty Alec, this is a... What, so this is like the ugly duckling of the Bayside area, always been the cheapest. Shops have come up now. Schools are average. There's no schools there. But the shopping strip has come up really well. Most of the waterfront property is now being re redeveloped into brand new mansions. The money's flowing into Morialic eventually, um, thank God, because for years just nothing was happening there. You can still get a good three, four-bedroom townhouse for a million dollars. That's cash flow positive, which is amazing. And this area is going to continue to boom and perform very strongly in the next three to five years, irrespective of what, what's happening. So you can still pick up for 1 million, 1.1, 1 .1, you can still pick up a three bedroom, three, four bathroom, you know, 3.5 bathroom townhouse, um, 199 square meters internal area, which is fantastic. Chelsea, always a fantastic area, very difficult to buy on the beach side of the highway. So just so you understand, these suburbs are all cut in half by train line. So you have people living on this side of the highway and, and the train line, and then and, which is the beach side, which means you can walk to the beach from your property. And there's people living on the other side of the highway and the train line, which, which really, those properties are completely different in terms of capital growth potential and the type of people that live there. They're much cheaper, much less potential for rental yield appreciation and for growth. Now, they're still good to buy into because this is only a very small fraction of the suburb, but if you can get on, on this side of the beach, then you just hold it for the rest of your life. I mean, this will be, these are legacy properties. You know what I mean? This is, you can count how many properties in Melbourne have waterfront views. This development is um, fantastic. It's about 50 metres from the sand, so you can walk down to the beach in Chelsea, which is one of the nicest beaches in Melbourne. There's no um, backyards, but your rooftop terrace, which is a, the entire floor plan of your roof, is a rooftop terrace overlooking the water, so you'll be able to see over all the houses and have glimpses over the beach. The most important thing is the proximity to the water is, is great. It's a great developer. He's been developing for nearly 30 years. He does high-end developments in Brighton, Brighton East, 
in those areas and then entry level in places like Aspendale, Edithville, Chelsea, Bomb Beach, Carrum, Patterson Lakes. So once again, um, very boutique development. There's only in that one six properties. These are great two betters. Um, targeting the young urban professional couple. So you have one car garage entry, then you have a laundry under the stairs, master bedroom with an ensuite with a small courtyard, very small courtyard. Then upstairs you have open plan living area, dining area, another bedroom with an ensuite with a balcony, and then the whole surface area of your townhouse is a rooftop terrace, which is awesome. 5.9 meters by 5.5. So you can really comfortably entertain your friends, chill out, read a book, have a coffee overlooking one of the nicest beaches in Melbourne. If you're interested in securing one of these, there's three left in that project. Um, just drop me uh, an email or give me a call and I can um, send you all the information before it sells out. Mornington. I like Mornington. I've always, it's far from the city, but it's a coastal town that's just been an amazing success story in Melbourne. It's technically not Melbourne, it's actually Mornington, it's a separate area. Um, in terms of uh, capital growth, out of all the regional towns, it's been one of the fastest capital growth suburbs in Melbourne. So you can see there, in terms of 12 months, 18%, three years, 47%, mainly because of sea change and COVID-19. Five years, 44.7%. 10 years, 8.44, which is the average. So when you're looking at cash analysis, I would say Mornington is 8% growth, you know, for houses. Yes, there's been a, a, a sea change pressure on Mornington because of COVID, but that's an abnormality. This location couldn't be better. That's Main Street, which is the main drag there with all the coffee shops and, and restaurants that goes all the way to the beach. And this probably is right there. I mean, it's just perfect location. Also, great little townhouse development, targeting the young urban professional couple with no kids or retired couple. So these are all two betters, 695,000 to 710. We've just released this project. That's, by the way, that's the beach in Mornington. That's Main Street, street there. And the project's just off, off Main Street. So it's a really good location. These are all the shops and restaurants, by the way. Some of these properties here, Waterfront Mansions, have sold for four, five, six, seven million dollars. It's a very wealthy area. It's becoming a coastal town. Um, of choice by a lot of wealthy retired people in Melbourne. And there's a bit of an economy occurring there. It used to be an area where people just move out and get closer to the city. But now with people working from home, a lot of the younger people are staying put in Mornington and Mount Martha and all those areas, Franks and South, working from home and enjoying everything that the area has to offer, which is amazing beaches. And it feels like you're on holidays every day. I mean, it, it doesn't feel like you're in Melbourne. You kind of feel like you're in Queensland or Cairns or somewhere. They're the beaches in Mornington, so, and you got views over the city. Once again, these are small two bedroom townhouses, which is your number one investment vehicle, is your two bedroom townhouse, three bedroom townhouse, targeting young professional couples. The worst property to buy, which I keep telling people, is a four bedroom house on land where you have a family with five kids, two cats and a dog, and it'll destroy your whole property. You want to buy properties, guys, that are non conducive for families. I keep repeating that. Otherwise, you'll be damaged. Okay, now people say, well, there's lower capital growth. No, there isn't. There isn't. You get higher rental yield in these properties and you get no damage from tenants. That's the, that's the reality. Um, so you get bedroom downstairs, toilet, garage, upstairs, another master bedroom with an ensuite. And then you have um, your laundry, open plan living, dining area, and the balcony. So this property is here, 695. Around about 16 month settlement. So targeting, I think that we'll settle, the market will be up higher. Very good entry level into the property market. Couldn't think of a better property in Melbourne to invest in for that price. I mean, 695 is nothing, guys. <laughs> Clayton townhouses are selling for a million now. Clayton. <laughs> Freaking Clayton. You know, it's just, it's incredible. Um, so 695 rent per week is about 480 to 520. And then you got council rates and owners' corporation fees. Internal to 94 square meters. So it's like a large two bedroom apartment, slightly larger, because you've got the garage. Um, this is from uh, BMT depreciation. 
They cash flow positive by $11 per week as well after depreciation. So unbelievable um, that they're cash flow positive, which means you're getting $11 in your pocket every week by holding onto these properties. So they're cash flow positive with deductions. Without negative gearing and deductions, they're negative $77 per week. So if you weren't working, you had no other income, not even Centrelink, just this, then you have to put $77 per week in your out of pocket into this property. If you've got any job that will aid to get the loan, it's going to be cash flow positive for you, which is great. Another development here in Port Melbourne, um, in Williamstown Road, this is 1.425, so this is a bit of an upmarket townhouse. Uh, complete 100% they've been lived in, three bedroom. Look, Port Melbourne, always top 10 best suburb in Melbourne. I mean, if you can buy anything, it doesn't matter if it's waterfront or in the industrial part of Port Melbourne at the back, just buy it. It's 2.5 Ks from the city, guys, on the water. It's a no-brainer. You know, just keep buying Port Melbourne. Um, these people fight over these properties. I mean, you're going to get 30 applications, 10, 10 to 30 applications, depending on where we are in the property cycle. Majority of leases expire in January. So there's obviously in December, you're going to get a lot lower applications than compared to someone that wants to move in in January. Once again, amazing property, brand new, never been lived in, full depreciation. That's the beach in Port Melbourne. And you got all the cafes and restaurants there. Amazing lifestyle. Um, triple story. So you have open plan downstairs. Um, it's a study nook with a toilet and laundry. Open plan living area, kitchen, island bench top, two bedrooms with a common ensuite. And then you got the master bedroom upstairs with a massive ensuite with a, with a balcony. So they're three-level properties, um, yeah, quite amazing. In terms of capital growth, um, 38% for three years, 6.57 for 12 months, um, 10 years, 8.14, five years, 28.64. There's a huge variance in Port Melbourne because you've got very expensive properties, you've got quite cheap properties, you've got warehouse conversions, you've got the industrial part towards the back where you used to have all the old factories, the frontage, you've got heritage-protected properties, you know, one street can make a difference of three to five percent growth per year, but on average, when you do cash flow analysis, just do eight percent. You know, that's a good good um, measure. They're cash flow positive by nine dollars a week, which is crazy. Cash flow positive. Um, that's it, guys. Um, a couple of things I want to make you aware of. What's the next step? There are four types of investors out there that I'm noticing. There's the analytical compulsive information gatherer. They just sit back looking at data and they're just about to. Oh, I'm just going to. Just going to jump in when, when the bottom of, of the... Oh, I missed it again. Shit. There's those people who never do anything and they just keep paying half their income tax, half their income in tax every year. So engineering people especially, they want 150 grand a year and they keep giving away 60 grand to the government. Why? Guys, these are cash flow positive. Two of these could get your tax virtually halved. Three or four and you're paying zero tax. Yeah, Conrad, but I'm going to do my research. I'm going to jump in when, when there's a perfect time. Ooh, ooh, it's, 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 ooh, another 10 years went by. There's the get rich quick people, which really concern me. They're always on TikTok and they're selling NFTs and Bitcoin and there's always the latest shiny thing. Now, I don't, they, they really scare me, these people. They, well, they believe anything you tell them, which is the reason why they never have any money. They really concern me. Property's not for you guys. Property's a long-term game, 10-year plan. So probably, you know, you want to get something else. The comfortable, comfort zone investor, they buy around where they live, three to five Ks, because they know the area, they know the schools. Nothing wrong with it, but if they live in an area that's average, they're going to be maxing out very quickly. You've got to buy in areas that just go up in value. And there's a savvy, educated property investor. These are the ones that make a plan, they get a team together, they create a plan of attack, a methodology for selecting properties, they stick to the plan, and then they source properties, and then they replace their income. And that's what you want to be if you're serious about investing. So if you're interested in learning more, we're running the Real Estate Investing Fast Track Weekend. We're back. The first one is sold out in two days, which is incredible. So we're probably going to release another one. So if you jump onto that website, realestatefasttrack.com.au, you can always check out future dates. That website's always up to date. If you can buy a ticket there for $47, it's available. If you can't buy it, it'll sell sold out. Um, there's only 40 seats available per event. We run them here in our office. 
Um, these are the speakers. So Stephen McMolner, who's the MC, he's a property strategist. Cameron Fisher from Changing Places Real Estate. He's a valuer originally by trade, and he's been doing real estate now for close to 40 years. And myself on property sourcing and Stephen McClatchy from Loans Australia on structuring and loans. It's a two-day event. The first day you're in a classroom environment and it's all about structuring, finance, property selection methodology. Day two, we put you on the bus and we showcase five or six projects and we educate you on the projects, floor plans, location, capital growth potential, um, the good, the bad and the ugly of Melbourne. Um, it, they're amazing events because they kind of marry up the, the reality of the situation with the practical implementation of the, of the information. So not only do you get the theory, the formulas, you get to see real properties. For a lot of people, seeing a property, walking around in a townhouse or an apartment or a house and, and getting to understand the property at that level and then looking at the charts and the graphs and depreciation schedules and Excel spreadsheets, marrying up the two can make the difference between investing and not investing. Remember, the hardest thing to do is to start. Once you get started correctly, then you'll never look back. If you get started incorrectly, you get the worst accountant, the wrong mortgage broker, the wrong property, you're probably never gonna go back into the market. So for those of you who are interested in getting more education, um, feel free to book yourself in. Um, and this is an amazing two day event that we're gonna be running this year and then probably we'll do about six or seven next year. So stay tuned for future dates. Um, tickets are only $47 plus you get a hard copy of my book which is kind of like the manual for this whole course, Real Estate Investing Made Simple. Um, there's a money back guarantee. If you're not happy by the first day, come to me and say, I'm not happy with the information. I'll give you your $47 back and you can keep the book. And by the way, I've never had one refund in all the years that I've ran these events. And I've been running these events now for eight years. So except for the last two years with COVID-19. So we started, I should say, eight years ago and there was a two year gap. Also, for those of you who can't make it physically to Melbourne, by all means, you can get a home study as well, which we'll eventually record. Um, some of you might want to get started and jump the queue and have a free strategy session with myself, where we work out a plan of attack. We work out where you are, where you want to be. And remember, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have clarity about what you want to do. And I can make it super simple for you. I can tell you how to get market ready, what kind of properties are relevant to you, and then I can source those properties for you and give you the whole team. The plan is everything, guys. Don't do anything until you make a plan that's all, all inclusive of everything. Your situation, your time frame, your tax, your risk profile, the amount of years you're left at work. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, guys. Most people waste so much time doing this to get from A to B. And eventually they get there and go, oh man, if we just knew all the stuff now that we knew, didn't know 10 years ago, what I do and what smart people do, this is why humanity progresses, is they go from A to B with the path of least resistance by leveraging of other people's knowledge and other skills. Accountants, financial planners, lawyers, mortgage strategists, people like myself that source properties all day. We can do things probably better than you because we're doing one thing all day, every day for years, and we master that one section. It, I mean, it's not rocket science, guys. It's just logic. So if you want to fast track your wealth creation through property, and you're either just don't want to do it yourself, or you're too time poor. A lot of my clients are dentists, doctors, surgeons, um, who are very time poor. They work incredible hours. When they've got the weekends, they want to spend it with their family. They want to be looking at real estate. I look at real estate all day. You can leverage my skill set and my time. So initially I do one hour strategy session, work out where you are, where you want to be, and I'll give you a written plan of how to get from A to B. You get a personal introduction to my whole team, my mortgage broker, accountant, solicitor, everyone that you need in your whole team of experts. And by the way, just getting this people in Melbourne, this team is worth getting the consultation because it took me a decade to find them. And these are the best in the industry. You work away with a whole strategy and it's paint by the numbers, guys. It's literally do this, get this loan package, come back, we'll find the property worth this much money with this rental yield, with this depreciation, then you go here, then you go there. It's literally like that. There's very little thinking involved. Now, unfortunately, because I saw some of the top 50 suburbs and 15 suburbs that are going through gentrification, Melbourne um, is getting expensive. 
you know, surprise, surprise, which is good because if it was getting cheaper, <laughs> then I would be in trouble with my education because I keep telling people these areas are going to go up in value and there's videos on YouTube now that are 70 years, 8 years old. So if I was <laughs> getting it wrong, then I wouldn't be around. Um, if you're a single person, you need to be making around about $100,000 mark, about 95 to 100. You've got to have about 112,000 in equity or cash to, to kind of afford a $700,000 property. I don't really have anything under 700. Like when I say 700, 695 is the cheapest entry level. No one's going to build anything in a good suburb cheaper than 700,000 guys. There's just no margin in it. Okay. If you're a couple, you need to be on about 120, 140,000. And the same thing, about 112,000 equity or cash. So you can afford to buy a $700,000 property. You need to be able to get into your first property. Um, if you can't, there's no point seeing me because I don't have anything cheaper. I don't do regional towns. I don't do anything cheaper than that. So if you qualify for that roughly, or you're close to that, by all means, we can have a sit down, we can do a Zoom call. Um, if you've been to a live event, all you've got to do is fill out this form and send it to me or email to me. Or if you're just watching this on YouTube right now, all you got to do is email me directly, conrad at investorsprime.com.au and just request a free consultation with your name and details and mobile number and I'll be in contact with you and book you in. Hope you enjoy the content of this video, guys. Um, I, know I went over time a little bit. This is Conrad Bobby Lack. I'll see you on the inside.